City Council crisis in Leh. All parties okay with by-election for Garoka. And Minister clarifies cattle deal. This is the National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Wednesday's news. Member-elect for Goroka Open, Henry Ame and petitioner Bira Sopa are both content with the court's decision for a by-election. This came about after the Supreme Court dismissed a review application by Mr. Ame to declare the petition null and void. Mr. Ame is saying it may put a halt to development programs for the people of Goroka on who will represent them in Parliament. Petitioner and former member for Goroka, Bira Kimisopa, saying a petition is needed to mend the loopholes in the election system. With the Supreme Court dismissing a review of the National Court's decision to reject the results of the Greek count and declare the election of the Goroka Open seat null and void on the 7th of February 2019, the Goroka Open seat is now expected to go to by-elections if the current 2017 elected member, Henry Ahmed, decides not to pursue further legal actions. The decisions made is uh, fair and I accept that and, uh, you know, uh, what more can I do? I have to go and face my people and, you know, when I go and face my people, they know what I've done for the district. I'm sure they will return me again in the by-elections. The Goroka open seat has been the second petition filed after the 2017 election by former member for Goroka, Bira Kimisopa, on the ground that the Electoral Commission counting officials had counted the second and third vote together, which led to the declaration of Henry Abe. The Goroka open election dispute is a watershed moment for PNG. It, it casts a terrible indictment on the LPV system. Uh, as I see it. And I think the judges came out uh, on top in terms of interp in the interpretation of the scrutiny of uh, the votes, how it's counted, you know. Uh, the idea that you could count second and third together, that's unconstitutional. And it was established in court and reaffirmed by the Supreme Court, uh, you know. What should have followed on the 7th of February 2019 was a by-election. Mr. Abe stating that while court proceedings were lengthy, he wanted to contest the fact that the initial petition was not seeking a by-election election but a recount if there is a possibility of going any further in the uh, judiciary system then we might take that option too but uh, you know uh, for a start the decision is made by the courts I accept the decision um, if they're going to be the by, by election then let's live by it I'm happy to go the three bench Supreme Court judges, Justice McHale, Justice Murray and Justice Paulu Makiela, yesterday upheld the application filed by Biri Kimisopa seeking to dismiss the application for review based on instances of non-compliance of court orders and failing to prosecute the review with due diligence. Mr. Kimisopa stating the decision has set a precedent which clearly defines that vote number two and three cannot be counted as one vote. The decision also shows serious issues of how the Electoral Commission conducted the 2017 elections. It's one thing to obtain cost after you go through a rigorous, very strenuous exercise of litigation in court. Then you ask for compensation, and there's room for it uh, uh, as parties involved. But uh, the the perpetrators are left uh, unscathed, and that's something uh, for the electoral commission and perhaps the government to determine because you need to penalize the lawbreakers and penalize the wrongdoers for allowing uh, uh, issues like this. So for now, the people of Goroka District will have to decide again who will represent them leading into the 2022 national general elections. Adelaide Sirks, Kari National, MTV News. Agriculture Minister John Simon has come out clear on the recent deal the Livestock Development Corporation has signed with a private company to import cattle for slaughter in the country. His remarks come after various comments on social media by people claiming that the deal was bad for the country. He said this agreement will pave way for the country to start breeding cattle and to cater for the high demand for meat. 
After the deal was signed between the Livestock Development Corporation and Taylor Pacific, people have gone out on social media to raise concerns about it. They claim the deal is bad for the country and the government must not invite foreign investors to invest in the sector. They say the government must look at improving farming facilities to breed and slaughter cattle in the country and not import cattle. However, in response to their claim, Agriculture Minister John Simon says the deal will help generate revenue to develop the livestock sector. The country will benefit big time because the country does not have the money to fund livestock right now. There is no money. No one is giving us any money. But, a, but, a, but LDC has a lot of properties. LDC has assets. But LDC cannot turn it around immediately. We don't, we don't have liquid assets. We don't have cash right now. So this is exactly what I'm doing. According to the minister, there are less than 40,000 heads of cattle in various farms in the country, which is not enough to cater for the increasing demand for meat in the country, and they cannot risk slaughtering these cows. He said this agreement will see cattle being imported and slaughtered in the country, which will pave way for breeder cattle to be brought into the country. He said their aim is to cut down on imported beef. Even with the beef that we have in Ramu and in other places, we're still importing beefs. We're still importing the beef. So demand is still there. It's very high. So what we're doing is to cut down on the import. Yet the local industry, the local market is being, uh, certain percentage of it is being, uh, being taken care of by Ramu and other, um, other cattle ranches, but that's not enough. LDC Managing Director Terry Coim also stressed on the importance of the agreement, saying under this agreement, LDC is leasing their properties to Taylor Pacific to use, and the company will be paying the government on every cattle imported and slaughtered. He said this will help generate revenue for the country. So we are making this agreement with this guy who is willing to take their risk. He's going to meet all the cost. He's going to pay for the cattle in Australia. He's going to pay for the shipping cost. He will also bring all this cattle into this, uh, into our country, and then he will bring them over to the abattoir for slaughtering. And he will pay us for using the facilities. I don't pay him anything. The MD further added that breeder cattle cannot be brought into the country unless there are better quarantine facilities in place. And there are discussions in place to establish quarantine facilities in various ports in the country. This will pave way for breeder cattle to be brought into the country to help increase the number of cattle in the country. Uh, the minister and uh, the prime minister have discussed about the possibility of setting up, uh, setting up quarantine. quarantine facilities. We will have ports in four locations around the country. These quarantine facilities are the prerequisite for us to import breeder heads of cattle. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. Lay MP John Russell has threatened to go to National Executive Council to seek the suspension of the Lay City Council if the management doesn't work with the Lay City Authority to manage its finances. The council owes more than 4 million kina to the Internal Revenue Commission and a further 4.2 million kina to number one super. John Russell told a public gathering of councillors, contractors and officials that the funds need to be better managed before the IRC and the super fund freeze all their accounts. The IRC has already served a garnishy order on the council to recover the outstanding taxes. It's no secret that the Lay City Council and the Lay Urban Local Level Government are not in good financial standing. Both organizations are terminally ill, financially incapacitated by 20 years of mismanagement. And that mismanagement has been public knowledge when the investigation reports of the abuse were made available in 2017. For the LU LLG, it owes higher car companies up to 20 million kina. And today at this public forum between the lay MP, council officials and councillors, there was more bad news. You mean LCA is just collecting your money to make sure that you've got that money you're spending? Where were they the last 30 years? All now fix it or something? Two years we fix it over something? Where were they? The workers, do you know that you are owed over 4 million kina? The council has cut your money, no no paying below PSF. Do you know PSF is going to garnish you all your council account? 
Do you know that the IRC is going to garnish all your accounts? Dino Bufanto now standing is 27 million. Immediately after being elected, John Rosso brought in investigators from the Intergovernment Relations Department and they found widespread instances of corruption and abuse. He also pushed through a legislation to establish the Lay City Authority. Then, through a ministerial directive, he sought to plug the theft within the council. Uh, because long uh, outstanding issues around them are uh, two plug governments, a government long uh, local level government, long lay, na lay city authority. Islam amoklo hinder him all services. The ministerial directive gave permission for the lay city authority to collect and hold revenue in trust. But that move that has the support of the chairman of the LCA and the Lord Mayor James Kay has faced a lot of resistance from within. The Usadi line or top management been sitting here for ages now. Still they cannot do enough now. Collaborate corruption now. All these stops taken. I don't need them. I want the PA to take all of them back to the provisional administration pool. Now I want to put the, uh, uh, the position to advertisement, advertise the position, and I then get good people to work with me to talk about the betterment of our city. The basic idea explained in this morning's meeting was to manage the existing revenue streams better, grow the funds, restructure the council, and improve the basic delivery of services in Lay City. It's simple yet difficult for many of those within the already collapsing system. The risk of not addressing the outstanding money owed to the IRC and the super funds are serious. If it's not built, they shut down all the accounts that belongs to the council. And it is uh, by law that uh, those, uh, the IRC and the super funds are paid. Scott Wyde, National MTV News, Lee. Almost 40 continuing students from Balob Teachers College in Lay were being denied registration for being a day late. The students travel to Lay from East Sipic, Western Province and the Highlands. Among them are six government-sponsored students, while the rest are self-sponsored. They said they were late due to the struggles of meeting the college fee demanded by the administration, whilst others said the tribal fights in the Highlands caused the delay. Meanwhile, the administration has ordered the students to withdraw and register again next year. After two weeks of negative response from the administration of Balog Teachers College, the continuing students went to the media and called for assistance from the education department. They said they were denied registration for arriving late on campus due to situations beyond their control. Me apply the loan, look sim loan, no bank, come loan, the main branch, but me me wait lo online ba online lo bank ba walk lo loan eh, I'm taking time, roughly four four weeks, four weeks I'm taking me lo walk lo this la loan so. At the end I'm saying I'm 21st February eh, this Friday, I'm loan I'm approved straight, mix him, mix him coins, me deposit one time same time lo. School fee, Gonzalo school account. Only receipt now, I mean, same speed, I'm Friday, I'm going to have a layer. I'm going to have Monday, I'm going to register, I'm going to have late. Every student comes from different backgrounds, they should understand that. So, like, as for me, I'm going to have a background with parents for me, I'm going to have a system for us. I'm going to have a lot of school fee, I'm going to have a lot of struggle, how I struggle and stuff, I'm going to have a lot of struggle and stuff. So, diff, uh, all the students come from different backgrounds. So, I'm hard to look inside and look at how I struggle with money. Money is not left behind, I'm not going to collect it. If I struggle, I'm going to come. Violence to how people come sleep, get up long, and I'm going to administration, you know, so I'm going to struggle with people who come long. Some Assembly area where all the trouble fights stop. Now all picking in all back home and wrote them taking time to come 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 up to school. But Principal Jerry Andy Gow and Deputy Principal Administration Jack Howup said the reasons were excuses and they won't be given a second chance. We have to comply with the policies, we have to comply with the directions. The students, some of the students are not complying with the directions that we give. They don't comply with the policies of the assessment policy. We explain things to them precisely and clearly that they must comply to this. Otherwise, you, they will be seeing as we are just doing things out of the policy lines. People are looking for excuses. 
We have an institution that operates on time. UNITEC operates on time. UOG operates on time. UOG operates on time. All institutions have a time frame. So there are people who are just running around looking for some reasons to bring the media here to tell us about their own needs, their own requirements. We operate on policy matters. And that's how we operate here. And that's the way we will operate here, to work with time. Six of them are government-sponsored students, while the rest are self-sponsored. They have traveled in from Isipik, Western Islands and the Highlands provinces. And we will still stand firm. They will not resist that. They will withdraw and come back next year. They said they couldn't withdraw this year because of a degree program the college intends to implement most likely next year that would affect the scheme of studies. I mean, it will be really difficult for us to withdraw. Because it, this year, like it's, they introduced a degree program and if we come next year, they'll be like telling us to come in as a first year. According to the rejected continuing students, they have paid their full school fees and the 75% upfront payment, but were still rejected. And while they were being denied registration, the administration allowed registration to continue for second and third NGI students and other flying students who also arrived late. We allowed few people who came on etiquettes, like New Guinea Islands, have genuine reasons those people can be looked at. They cannot be compared with a Highlander from Mount Hagen, where you are supposed to travel by PMV here or Tari. They also said that classes didn't commence last week. They waited to be given the chance to be registered with the late registration fees, but that didn't happen. The students are now calling on the education department to attend to their grievances. Some of us, we cannot even come and stand around like this. We need help. We need your help, that's all. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, late. Still to come on National MTV News, Baisu Road Upgrade, Lincoln Rural Morbe and Governor Pakop to celebrate International Women's Day. Stay with us for the details. Welcome back. The main road leading to the Baisu Correctional Institution outside Mount Hagen City has deteriorated and needs urgent upgrading and road sealing. Baisu Jail Commander Chief Superintendent Timbi Kaugla says it's a shame local MPs and the provincial government are ignoring an important national institution in their province. Vasanatayama files this report from Mount Hagen. This road not only serves the prisoners and the warders and their families, but also serves more than 3,000 local and surrounding areas. It is also the road which leads to the famous Cook Heritage Site, which attracts local and international tourists every year. But the road condition itself is worse. Provincial government at not at one time came to an assistance. The clear indication is our road from confirmed to Baisu, very poor. Since about 10 to 15 years, there's no funding for Baisu. Although it is a national funded department, the provincial government is supposed to uh, take ownership of the institution. It is not sealed and has big potholes and drains. When it rains, traffic does not flow. This is one factor that is causing damage to prison vehicles. The frequent vehicle servicing is costing Baisu Jail big money. Money that can be used for other operations is being used to fix their vehicles. Despite being close to the city, the road condition is also a factor for warders to bring prisoners late to attend their court cases. The provincial governments, they're really concentrating on making business. Our business will not prosper when there's loan order problems. Jail Commander Kaugla is appealing for local MPs in the province and the Western Highlands Provincial Government to contribute and upgrade the Baisu Road. Kaugla said the prison and the surrounding communities are being ignored for many years with less development in the area. Also take ownership of the institution where the people are. If they want to uh, raise more money for the province and for the safety of the people in the province, they're supposed to uh, assist with funding and resources with it. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. 
The National Executive Council has approved the construction of a 200 million Kina highway linking Finchhafen, Sialum and Kabum in the Morbe province. The Fisika highway is a missing link that will open up economic and social opportunities for thousands of Morbians in three districts. The announcement was made during the opening of a smaller road project linking inland Finchhafen to the coast. At Ebebang village in the Burumquat local level government area, the people have gathered to mark the opening of a 17-kilometer road linking this village to Oligiru on the coast. This road branches from the main road to Finchafen and relieves the burden of making a five-hour journey over a very bad road. The place has rich agricultural potential that remains untapped and undeveloped. But there were more important announcements to be made. The Finchafen MP, also the finance minister, told people that the much-talked-about concept of the Fisica Highway, the highway linking Finchafen, Sialum and Kabum, will soon become a reality after the National Executive Council approved funding of more than 200 million people. Um, so I think contract them, people are winning this law. China will be international group which are working at the Yalu side, so they've easily mobilized and we start that. And seen for years, Morobe MPs have been calling for a road link into three districts. That project is about to happen soon. And while it may cost a quarter of a billion kina, the job of linking people in Papua New Guinea's biggest province to the capital city is expected to reap enormous economic benefits. Scott Waide, National MTV News, Lay. To commemorate International Women's Day this Sunday, National Capital District Governor Poas Pakop is planning to host an event to end violence against women and girls in the capital city. Events are expected to start at 5 a.m. with the International Women's Day walk and yoga for life at Mari Barracks to the Paga Hill Ring Road. Michelle Stephen with the details. The walk on Sunday, the 8th of March, will be dedicated to the International Women's Day, where all organizations and government departments are expected to be present with their banners and statements on gender equality, gender violence, and respect for women and girls. The governor will also be hosting high-level UN officials during that day. Among them will be United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, who is a former politician and women's advocate. She will be in Port Mosby from March 8th to 9th to commemorate the day and officially co-launch the Spotlight Initiative to end violence against women and girls in the city and the entire country. And City Governor Paul Spakop says this will be an excellent opportunity for city residents to be part of the walk. It's time for us in the city to show our commitment, to show that we are a city that is committed to gender equality and it's committed to overcoming this crisis that is facing our people, especially women and girls, gender-based violence. Many and some men out there might uh, have problems with these issues because they don't understand. But I want them to put themselves in the shoes of women of our city and our country. Being a woman in our country is a risky life. UN Women Representative Susan Ferguson says there is a continuous call to end violence against women and girls. Men should take the lead during events like this for their mothers, sisters, wives and daughters. I think that this call, this continuous call to, for men to be involved in making the changes, I think is just so important. Activities are currently being planned for the YWFL program, cumulating to the official launch of the Spotlight Initiative at Gordon's Market. And we all know that we've been trying to bring awareness about, uh, you know, the negativities, okay, in relation to gender violence, you know, for a long time. And this will never stop, you know, and I think governor has been a very strong advocate of that, fully supported by United Nations. And I think it's, it's a call that we all should embrace and we all should support. Michelle Steven, National MTV News. The Superannuation Fund and PNG Investment Promotion Authority yesterday signed an agreement to facilitate closer cooperation. It enables the fund to have a permanent presence at IPA's registration kiosk. Nest Fund is the first private sector agency to sign this agreement. Yeah, the National Superannuation Fund is the first 
private sector agency to sign an agreement with PNG Investment Promotion Authority. The agreement provides a platform for both organizations to share relevant employer database information. This can be used to ensure that companies who register with IPA also sign up to superannuation for the benefit of their employees. Today's signing um, is an example of how we can make use of the information that, that we collect, that we do keep records of, so that we can make um, additions that, uh, that lead to better outcomes. Yeah. The agreement also allows Nest Fund to share employer data for further awareness through IPA offices within the country. IPA Managing Director Clarence Hoot says such partnerships are encouraged and IPA expects companies to contribute to superannuation funds. Part of this, part of what the IPA will do in terms of our approval processes is to ensure that Every new business that comes into Papua New Guinea in terms of foreign investment, the requirement or the condition for super fund um, um, uh, alignment is, is put as a condition for them to comply with. Implementation of the agreement will start in the coming weeks. Lilian Soperakenea, National MTV News. Vanilla farmers in Maprik, East Sipik province have raised concerns over the significant drop in vanilla prices in recent months. They claim the only vanilla buyer in the district is controlling the price to suit their own interest. However, Maprik MP John Simon, in responding to their call, said there are plans to bring in more investors, but the people must maintain the quality of vanilla they produce in the district. In Maprik district, people depend on vanilla as their main source of income, apart from cocoa and coffee. And people also come from nearby districts to sell their vanilla to the only buyer based in Maprik. According to local vanilla farmers, the price of vanilla has dropped from over 1,000 kina per kilogram to 300 kina per kilogram. They are questioning why the significant drop in vanilla price that is affecting local farmers. There must be a way out. There must be a way forward. All right, bring this very important economy back. The people, our rural people, depend entirely on vanilla, cacao, and coffee. Why is the price going down? They are also calling on their local MP to bring in more investors. But according to local MP John Simon, the significant drop in price is also to do with the quality of vanilla. But you will must have him talk. Have him talk, maybe, what oh, good, maybe, you will give him this land. The member adding that some farmers have been harvesting vanilla beans which are not ready for harvest and that has caused the drop in quality. He challenged farmers to process vanilla beans accordingly to maintain quality. He further highlighted plans for a new investor to provide competition. According to the MP, the investor is willing to pay over 250 US dollars per kilogram of vanilla, which is equivalent to over 800 kina. However, the vanilla beans must be 15 centimeters long with good quality. He said there are plans to bring in more investors, but also challenge farmers to focus on producing quality vanilla beans. You must give him good price, Lomibla. That's all. You must make him good quality beam. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. When we return, updates on our preparedness to counter coronavirus and stories making headlines overseas. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to the news. Doctors from the Morabe Coronavirus Response Team are urging lay residents to observe basic hygiene rules like hand washing, cooking food well, and avoiding close contact with persons who have flu, cough, and experience other influenza-like symptoms. These are precautionary measures that have been echoed by the team in the past five weeks of awareness. The Marbury Coronavirus Committee conducted awareness for staff at the provincial administration in late today. For persons with influenza-like symptoms, doctors say they have to be more than one meter away from others to prevent spreading the symptoms. If you have that running nose or influenza-like illness, uh, the same distance and two meter. Keep yourself at two meter. Circumference and two meter. Then you prevent him or you prevent him, you yet look his mask. They have also advised against handshakes as one of the personal health measures. Mask go inside na, sigan loge na holim holim han loge na, sigan sigan. Em desla time em over na. Sigan, coronavirus shake and em show him you clapini sa. Not that, no, that. The coronavirus outbreak started in Wuhan, China last year and has since spread to several other countries including Singapore, Australia and New Zealand. More than 90,000 people have been infected with a death toll of over 3,000. So far there have been no confirmed cases in the country. The rest of the awareness will be carried out by a public health team a week after that and then continue they will be doing that. So my two weeks of engagement probably will, unless some people really want a special request that we can go and run some training. The coronavirus response team has been conducting awarenesses for several weeks with plans to concentrate on the Lei Bulolo Makam and Hue and Gulf districts. These are the districts where the entry and surveillance points into the province are. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lei. Turning overseas, there are concerns tonight that a group of Italian tourists who arrived in New Zealand just hours before new travel protocols were put in place have been circulating in the city. The New Zealand Prime Minister announced on Monday that all incoming visitors from northern Italy, along with South Korea, would be required to self-isolate for 14 days. Of 15 Italians arrived in Auckland Monday morning on an Emirates flight, the majority from northern Italy. Italy currently has the greatest number of coronavirus deaths outside of China, with 79. The group planning a countrywide two-week trip of our tourist hotspots. On Monday afternoon, just hours after their arrival, Jacinda Ardern pulled the handbrake on any future Italian holiday hopes. Incoming travellers from northern Italy and South Korea will now be asked to self-isolate for 14 days. It would seem this group just squeezed into the country before the restrictions came into force. But today it appears the government's moved the goalposts. Obviously we changed the system where two-week isolation kicked in when you announced it on Monday afternoon. So for anyone who travels from northern Italy before that, what should they do? Um, they should also go into self-isolation. We're requesting that they do that uh, until 14 days have passed um, since their arrival. One News had a tip off the company organising their tour, the AOT group, part of Hello World Travel, was actively exploring ways to get them on their way, ignoring our request for information for 24 hours. Responding today saying, At present, none of the passengers are showing any signs of coronavirus. They fully understand the potential risks and do not wish in any way to put others at risk. They have therefore decided to remain where they are, follow the guidance and return to Italy at the earliest opportunity. We wanted to know had they taken to the streets of Auckland enjoying some of the sights or indeed self-isolated. Had the company notified authorities or the Ministry of Health of their plans? No reply. The Ministry confirming it hasn't heard from the tour company. A spokesperson for tourism industry Aotearoa says there are a lot of grey areas and the new travel protocols were made without thinking through all of the implications. We hope that uh, people follow the rules and that's what they need to do. Goodwill, a vital part of New Zealand's coronavirus defence. Up next, some sporting updates in Chuka Sports. Stay with us.
Two Kai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. PNG boxer John Ome defeated Saudi Arabian opponent Nassim Sadiq by TKO in the third round of the Olympic qualifiers in Amman, Jordan. The referee stopped the contest after Ume's right hand sent Sadiq to floor, bringing an end to the fight. Ume takes on Mongolia tomorrow afternoon in the second preliminary round. A win over Mongolia will put him in contention to qualify for the Tokyo Olympics. PNG female boxer Flora Logger will have have her first bout tomorrow and in the men's 57 kg division PNG's Jamie Chang takes on Iran on Saturday. This year sports federations in the country are at their busiest working side by side with PNG Olympic Committee as they prepare to send their athletes to various Olympic qualifiers in numerous countries as athletics, boxing, rugby, swimming, weightlifting and other sporting codes are attending their qualifiers. Sailing is one sport that has already qualified through 20-year-old Tia Ricky Numa, who is looking forward to representing PNG. Terrific left hand to the body. Wants with less than three months that this year's Olympic Games in Tokyo, PNG athletes both in country and overseas under the sporting federations are now training and attending qualifier events in various countries to qualify for the Games. Recently attending the Australian Open Weightlifting Championships in Canberra as part of her Olympic qualifiers was Commonwealth Games gold medalist Dika Toa who made PNG proud by winning gold as part of her race to the 20. 20 Tokyo Olympics. Also Pacific Sprint Queen Toya Whistle, who recently went down to Gold Coast to train for her upcoming international meets, says she is looking forward to qualifying for Olympic Games. And preparing myself for World Indoor Championships in China and then um, training base in Brisbane for other competition coming up like Oceania in Sydney and then there's other one in Melbourne and then from there going to um, Wellington for um, the nationals there, so yeah. While she has upcoming meets in various cities in Australia, as well as the Indoor Athletics Championships in China, Whistle is aiming to break her current Pacific Games time of 11.5. I need to be top 50 to got into the uh, team or you need to run uh, fastest time to go into the uh, yeah to the team so but one athlete that qualified first for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and first athlete to have his name on the list is 20-year-old Tiriki Numa, who is representing the sport of sailing at the Games. Also in sailing, sister Rosalie Numa is the second PNG athlete to qualify. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say it was an easy one to get, but um, yeah, I tried to give up my best and you know, I was like, man, I'm going to sail till my legs fall off, that's it. Um, so I, I need to go home with this. I mean, we've come a long way. Working as the strength and conditioning coach for Cricket PNG, Tiriki says he is looking forward to getting back into doing further training on the waters of Australia. Yeah, I was doing more gym, gym stuff, just focusing on my strengths and stuff like that. My body was pretty much built to just be, you know, look good and stuff like that. Where uh, if I would have spent that time on the water, my body would have adapted to being a professional sailor. And I think another athlete also training is Rachel Saperi James for the Continentals happening late in April as part of the Olympic qualifiers. Meanwhile, PNG boxers who are currently in Jordan for the qualifiers have seen their first win through Pacific Games gold medalist John Ume. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sport. Chukai Sports continues with more after these messages. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Chukai Sports. The president of the Sogeri Township Soccer Association, Willy Vira, believes the Koyari people can offer some of the best soccer players in the country. He said this during an interview at the association's grand final.
After a wet grand final, the association president spoke of the passion shown for football. Soccer is known as rugby zone. But when Soccer Association started, I have seen raw talents. And today, they have shown the talent today. That they are also soccer players, not only rugby. So it's a bonus for the players that they can both represent in rugby and in soccer also. Koyaris can represent uh, the country in the future. So Gary, on which the football competition is based, is where the Koyari people have graced the nation with some of rugby league's big names. And it's evident with the soccer matches played under the rugby league goalposts. The competition plans on spreading the love of the game to the already widening interest. Yes, we have a very big plan to affiliate with PNGFA. So there are two interests there, that are PMSA and NCDC, Public Service Soccer Associations. So we will, uh, with my executives, we will meet and which one that they will select, we will affiliate with them. The association plans to start off the 2020 edition as early as possible, but first must acquit its dues. Uh, due to... Um, multiple requests from outside communities after two months of acquitting the small money that i got from the clubs registration i have to acquit back to them and then we will start off a new competition but after two months time bradley valenaki national mtv sports the Havea Cup is not just a Rugby League 9 tournament, it's also a huge health event. The tournament will have different health organizations provide information to the public on the importance of well-being and also offer free health checks. The Havea Cup tournament will provide free health checks for participating players. There will also be a Hevea Cup passport, which gives a list of different organizations that will be present on the day. The passport will cost two kina, which the public can purchase and will have to visit 10 stalls. And we'll ask people just to go visit 10 services, 10 NGOs, so non-government organizations of their choice. Fill the back page in um, with all your details, your contact number, uh, your, your name and your age. And then just before the finals, We'll pull out um, out of the barrel uh, 10 lucky winners that will win up to 50,000 kina worth of prizes. The Heavier Cup has been organized as a family orientated event that will have food stalls, face paintings, and many fun activities. We'll have jumping castles. If you get a little bit hungry, you can come and, like, you know, eat at the food stalls. We'll have face painting. Um, and I believe we'll even have some comedy acts coming through. Um, so it's a very, very, very family event. And uh, gate fee is only two kina. If you do want to park, it's 10 kina per car. Last year, Grasket Project organized a national art prize competition, inviting artists from around the country to participate. The winners will have their designs printed on the tournament uniforms. So at Havea Cup, you will see 12 men's teams and 12 women's teams wearing beautiful PNG-inspired artwork at Havea Cup. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. And that ends Shukai Sports. The weather details coming up next. Chukai Sports Chukai Sports This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus With you always A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow partly cloudy with chances of a shower or two right across the region in Port Moresby, Daru, Kerama, Alatau and Popandita. In the Mamasu region mostly fine apart from a light shower or two in Le, Wau, Biwak, Vanimo. Showers then fine weather in Medang. In the New Guinea Islands region, mostly cloudy with chances of bright light showers in Loringau and Kaviang, Kimbe included. Fine weather, although cloudy in Kokopo, Rabao and Buka. And in the Highlands region, cloudy with rain showers, then morning fog patches in Mount Hagen and Mendi, Wabeg included. 
cloudy with rain showers, then morning fog in Goroka and Kundiawa. Forecast for small crafts for the next 24 hours. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border to Daru to Yul Island to Hood Point and Aroma Coast. Seas of 0.5 to 1.3 meters. Waters of Samari Island and eastern and western Melbay Islands with waters of East Cape to Cape Fogel to Finchhafen, including waters of Finchhafen through Vitias and Dampier Straits to Siasi Island to Long Island with waters of Long Island to Medang to Bogia with waters of Wewak to Aitape to northern PNG Indonesian border and waters of Manus and its western group of islands with waters of New Ireland, east and west New Britain and Bougainville seas of 0.5 to 1 meter. A look at the ocean forecast the PNG areas in the Coral Sea. Sea slight with easterly to southeast winds at 10 to 15 knots. In the Solomon Sea, sea slight with north to northeast winds at 5 to 10 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, sea slight with northwest winds at 5 to 10 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, sea slight with northwesterly winds at 5 to 10 knots. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that ends National MTV News on behalf of the team. Pleasant evening. Good night.